Thank you, uh, Mark, and I, it's uh, good to welcome everyone to um, this session on the Fast Track Cities uh, initiative. Uh, I'm going to ask Bertrand if you're um, ready to uh, um, uh, kick us uh, off with an overview uh, of, of what Fast Track Cities is, how can cities get involved, and what can uh, parliamentarians uh, do uh, to uh, assist? Uh, and then uh, we'll hear uh, uh, from Professor Anderson, from Stephen uh, Nicholson, and from uh, Lisa Power about a uh, fast track city initiatives uh, across the UK. So, uh, Bertrand, I can uh, ask you uh, start, and you are the Vice President of the International Association of Providers of AIDS uh, Care, uh, uh, as was our first speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today as well. Uh, that's a very important uh, opportunity for us. Um, so I have a very short presentation for you, I, I swear. I don't have a lot of data and a lot of figures. Um, I don't know if, if you can share it, Mark. Okay, one second. Yeah. Um, uh, share. One second. I've got to find the share screen thing. Where's that? There. Um, one second. I've got to find it. Um, share contact, yes, yes, we, great, so you can go straight to the second slide, obviously, thank you very much, so just to, to take you back to basics, the, the Fast Track Cities initiative was founded on World AIDS Day, so on December 1st, just over seven years ago in 2014, by four organizations, um, three of which you know quite well, the city of Paris, uh, just because Paris has a long history of supporting HIV programs and having a budget line to support HIV programs in the city budget, both locally um, and also in partnership with other cities in Western Africa. UNAIDS, obviously, which is the, the, the United Nations programs on HIV and AIDS, and UN Habitat, which is another uh, UN organization helping with building health infrastructures in developing countries. Uh, and my organization, IAPAC, just a few words on IAPAC. As you said, IAPAC is the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care. We are a global not-for-profit membership organization with about 28,000 um, members globally. Um, and on the next slide, you will have a, a very quick map of our uh, country offices at the moment, uh, just to show you that, you know, we're trying to extend the work that we do, uh, IAPAC being originally US-based, and extend the work that we do globally with uh, a few offices in, in Europe, one in South America, one in Central America, one in Australia, two in Asia, and, and now six in Africa. So uh, we're one of the, of the co-founders of the initiative, and on the next slide, um, I am just reminding you of the global objectives of the initiative. So the initiative aims at uh, involving cities and local jurisdictions, sometimes it's provinces, departments, canton, whatever you have, um, into reaching four main objectives. The first three are the three UNEDS and WHO global objectives on HIV by 2030 which is 95% of people living with HIV know their status, so have access to testing and have actually had an HIV test. Uh, that 95% of people testing positive uh, have access to antiretroviral treatments, and 95% of them uh, have got an undetectable viral load. And we know scientifically that this now means that uh, someone who is living with HIV but has an undetectable viral load cannot transmit the virus. So it's another way 
to not only keep people living with HIV in good health, but also reduce the number of new infections globally. And the fourth objective that is just as important for us is aiming at zero stigma and discrimination. And we always insist on that fourth objective because we believe that it's not possible to reach any of the 395 in an environment where you still have a high level of stigma and discrimination, right? Um, on the next slide, I've, I've mentioned um, the other objective that have been added to the initiative uh, three years and a half ago now, if you can go to the next slide, Mark. Um, so we have included other objectives on hepatitis C, on tuberculosis, on sexually transmitted infections, and making sure that not only clinicians and care providers, but also communities involved in these topics can find ways to work together holistically and have a sort of inclusive, inclusive view at people's health. Um, but also uh, working on the long-term quality of life of people living with HIV um, and uh, looking at long-term HIV management. So that's all the objectives of the initiative. Uh, when we started in 2014, there were 26 cities that signed globally and four in Europe. And on the next slide, I have a map of the current um, member in red and candidate in blue cities in Europe. Uh, so as you can see, the initiative has been growing quite quickly. We have now 92 member cities in Europe and 63 candidates that are all reflected here on, on this map. Uh, and I would like to so focus on two parts of it. On the next slide is a very quick focus on Central and Eastern Europe, uh, just to show you that we already have a number of member cities in Central and Eastern Europe and quite a few candidate cities. Um, and as you know, given the, the epide epidemiological situation in Central and Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe being one of two regions in the world where the HIV epidemic has never decreased, and also one of the few regions in the world where um, a number of national governments um, still have national policies that actually increase stigma and discrimination um, with a lot, if not all, of the communities that we work with. It's definitely a priority for us to increase the number of Central and Eastern European uh, cities that we have in the initiative. You can see a number of Polish cities there. Um, the City Council of Warsaw, just two weeks ago, voted a motion to join the initiative, despite very open threats from the national governments to cut their funding to the city if they sign on the initiative. Um, but still the City Council voted 15 favor, nine abstentions, and zero against, right? So Warsaw will be one of the next European cities to join the initiative, and that's a very important event for us. Um, on the next slide, something that is even more relevant to what we are discussing today, which is basically a map of the five strongest national fast-track cities network that we have in Western Europe. Uh, these five countries being France, I'm very happy about it, <laughs> Spain, Portugal, Italy, and the United Kingdom. Um, you must know that um, the first city, the first UK city to, to join fast track cities was London. In great part, thanks to Professor Anderson with us today, um, it did take a while for a very good reason, which is that the day London joined, every stakeholder in London knew exactly what they wanted to do and how they could do it. Um, and then other cities in the UK followed really on that path. Um, and we now have a strong network of uh, fast-track cities in the United Kingdom, um, in three of the four nations, uh, the fourth one being um, North Ireland, and we are actually in touch with people in Belfast to make sure that Belfast can potentially join the initiative by the end of 2022. Um, and one of the priorities for fast-track cities in these five countries 
given the number of member cities and candidate cities in these five countries, is to make sure that what is developed at the local or regional or provincial uh, level um, actually does connect both with, with the policies and strategies and, and, and laws at the national level and with what elected members can push for at the national level. Um, just so that you know, we have had a similar session with the French Parliament back in November. Uh, we also had one with the Italian Parliament in uh, June last year. We're about to have one in Portugal next month and one in Spain in March, so next month as well, actually. Um, so what we are hoping is that in these five countries that are really priority countries for us, just because, you know, one of the projects we work we, we work on is called the Cohort of Champions, and it's a cohort of the cities that are doing the best toward the global targets, London being one of them. We would like to also have a sort of group of champion countries that can show that the initiative focusing on local programs, on building networks between um, mayor's offices, public health administrations, communities and clinicians at the local level can be articulated with national policies, rules, and laws. And for us, that's really the, the next step, one of the next steps in the United Kingdom. So on the next slide, just to finish, there are there is one opportunity that might be important to discuss that topic, which is uh, the next workshop that we are organizing for United Kingdom and Irish fast track cities. Uh, that will be the third one that will be in Manchester in April and we are doing it in partnership with the British HIV Association, just as we uh, do in Italy and in France and in Portugal. Um, I do suspect, even if I'm not making the decisions on the program, but there's a steering committee is, but I do suspect that um, the articulation between local programs and national policies uh, will be one of the topics that many United Kingdom fast track cities will want to discuss during that workshop. Um, so that's something that we, we, we should also discuss here probably. Um, voila, that's it for me. I've been 11 minutes instead of 10. I'm sorry for that. I'm French, I talk too much. It was an, an excellent 11 minutes, I, uh, especially <laughs> since you had just come on to uh, uh, the, co uh, the, the call Bertrand and the ground running. So thank you very much uh, <laughs> for that. That was, that was, a, it was, that was an excellent uh, overview. Um, uh, Professor Jane Anderson, who is the co-chair of Fast Track Cities London, I'm going to come to you next uh, for your overview. Thank you very much, David. I'm here with Gary Bruff, uh, who is um, our uh, community representative on the Fast Track Cities Leadership Group, and we're going to do a double act. Um, I should also say at this point that actually Brighton was the first UK city to join. I do take responsibility because I was trying very hard to get London to join, and Brighton said, oh, we can do that. And lo and behold, came up the inside lane and did it well before we did. What with it being a smaller and more nimble city? So, um, uh, Bertrand, you're, I, I certainly had the hat pin and did the poking, but it was uh, Brighton that made it work. Uh, so there we go. Um, so very quickly, um, I'm just going to give you a quick uh, snapshot of what the London Fast Track Cities is about, and Gary's going to tell you a bit more about the impact of some of the things we're doing. So. The issue for London was that when the Health and Social Care Act went through, so much of the, frag of the pathway around HIV became fragmented. It was quite fragmented before, but the Health and Social Care Act really made it difficult. And the Fast Track Cities Initiative requires everybody who's got a vested interest in anything to do with HIV to come together around one table. And that, in fact, is what we have established in London, and it is the only place in our city where all the players who have a reason to be there or an interest in being there come together. 
And of course, as Bertrand said, London is an incredibly complicated city. And to bring the accountable bodies together requires 33 local authorities and the NHS and the mayor's office and the doctors and everybody else to be behind a common purpose. And we achieved that in January 2018, which was our marker for when we actually went, signed up and got cracking. Now, the thing about London is we were already at 90, 90, 90 by the time we signed. And we very quickly were beyond 95, 95, 95. And at the moment, London is 97, 98, 96. So we set our objective really different, slightly differently from the uh, uh, Fast Track Cities Initiative. And we said, we're going to get to zero. So our slogan is London getting to zero, zero new infections, zero preventable death from HIV, best quality of life for people living with HIV and zero stigma. And actually, we've got everybody behind that common purpose. And now, four years on, four years of blimey, yes, four years on, uh, we've actually got a, a good structure hosted by the um, uh, Healthy London Partnership. We have a leadership group, which is the forum that brings everybody together. We've managed to produce a business case uh, and NHS England have funded us to the tune of six million over three years, which has largely come from London's underspend on the antiretroviral budget as drugs became generic. We managed to argue the case that we need some of that back. We've designed a roadmap, which I'm going to show you very quickly, and we are funding and coordinating a number of projects, and Gary is going to go into more detail about what they are. So I'm just going to very quickly show you the roadmap, um, assuming I can do that. Oh, and if I can't, so hang on, where are we? Can you help me on this one? Share, no, I, maybe I'm not going to be able to do this. Um, share content, here we are. <clears throat> okay, have you got that online? No. I don't, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to talk you through it because other, we run out of time otherwise and I'll spend too much um, time talking. So basically, our, our roadmap uh, takes us to starting at the end. If we want to get to zero by 2030, what will that look like? And we have come up with a number of statements of what Londoners and London should expect to be doing by 2030. We've then worked out what the map looks like to get us to there. And we've got four major tracks of work that we are doing through the leadership group, through subgroups, through partnership working. And our four major tracks of work are advocating advocating for London, wherever we are in the system, whoever we are in the system, working uh, together to champion London's um, uh, strategic vision. Our second point is the business about leading across boundaries. So engaging leaders, working with other fast track cities, complementing regional and national work. And that's really important because now we are aligned with the national strategy, the new HIV action plan, and actually the way that we've structured our roadmap aligns beautifully with the new action plan, which we're very pleased with. We've got a delivery strand, which we'll talk a bit more in a minute, but that's about working in partnership, crucially working in partnership, particularly between the NHS and the voluntary sector, uh, bringing things that normally would be in separate silos, bringing them together, bringing the additionality of partnership, uh, because actually London's got a lot going on. It's about bringing things together and communicating, 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 engaging and holding the narrative for what's going on in our city. So that's sort of how our structure works. And I'm now going to hand over to Gary because there are several projects that we're very proud of, which are about our delivery arm. And um, Gary's going to tell you about the impact. So Gary, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks, Jane. Uh, fingers crossed I will have more luck with my slide. Yeah, there you go. Success. OK, great. So thanks, Jane, for the strategic perspective. I'm just going to provide a little bit more granular detail of what happens on the ground. So um, I've been living with HIV for 30 years and working in the voluntary sector for the last 20 and within the NHS. Uh, and I currently work for Positive UK. And so uh, as far as the achievements of what London uh, have been doing in relation to the, the programmatic work, um, uh, and I can send you this with the, with the links uh, included in the PDF afterwards. 
Uh, we've we've already funded 12 improvement collaboratives with that voluntary sector and NHS partnership that uh, Jane spoke about, uh, using a quality improvement approach so that it's it, it we can see what the challenges and where the difficulties are and how we overcome them. Uh, we commissioned the, the, the National AIDS Trust and Britain Thinks to look at public knowledge and attitudes to HIV, which was done last year. And we've had a specific deep dive into what was the, what the issues were in London so that we can see where the challenges are around stigma uh, from a public perspective. Uh, we've drafted an H evolving HIV care report, which came from uh, both a group of the lead HIV clinicians across London, as well as a community advisory group making recommendations for the new ICSs as they come into play uh, this year and that was launched and we're, we're getting traction with the ICS is now in, in terms of implementing those. Um, we are launching next week an empowerment program uh, which is uh, being held by six organizations to address internalized stigma uh, and then a smaller part of that program is to train a team of HIV ambassadors to be able to challenge societal stigma uh, and link in with some of Fast Track City's work. Uh, and then finally and last but not least clearly is the additional work streams to address place-based stigma and then largely going wider to societal stigma, which we'll launch this year. And we're starting that with, the, with the, the NHS. So just in terms of providing a bit of a rationale for some of that partnership work, uh, one of the things that the Positive Voices um, survey in 2017 showed that whilst uh, HIV treatment information was great, there was a lack of connected peer support, support around talking about status and long-term condition management support for people with HIV. Uh, and the Beaver Standards of Care have been saying since 2013 that, that the NHS should work in better partnership with the voluntary sector, should engage skilled peer support workers. And in fact, when they updated their standards of care in 2018, they included um, recommendations and qualitative uh, auditable outcomes in six of the eight standards. Uh, to this end, I work for Positive UK and we provide outreach peer support in 16 uh, of the London HIV clinics. And so the particular one that we're working on in terms of the improvement collaborative is working with Chelsea and Westminster, which has the, the largest HIV patient cohort in Europe. Uh, and Positive UK have partnered with Plus Health and NAS Project, who are another two voluntary sector organizations. And we're working across the four clinics um, initially as a virtual service and now providing face-to-face -face support using QI methodology to think about how we better integrate peer support within the care pathway. Clearly, when people are diagnosed, when they're having challenges, being able to talk to somebody living with HIV provides a different perspective than just the medical model. Uh, and really, when we think about addressing stigma and improving quality of life, that lived experience is a key component. And therefore, you know, thinking about one to one support and group work is very key in terms of making those connections and providing people a sense of community. Uh, and what we've seen as a result of this is that over the first nine months, we saw a 900% increase in referrals compared to what used to happen when uh, one of the clinics would refer to us as an external, external organization. And we're intending and hoping to see uh, further increases. And so what we've put in place is, is four work streams specifically as touch points for that, that integration of, of peer support. So within the newly diagnosed patient pathway, so it's an opt out and automatically somebody will get a call from somebody within the team who's living with HIV to ask them if they'd like to have a chat. Uh, it might be a referral from the clinical team uh, for somebody who's having challenges, either they're not being able to manage their treatment, they're having additional psychosocial issues and they could link into a benefit service, for example. Uh, and so the team works on that. We're linking in uh, to the inpatient ward, so the people who are diagnosed late or who have been readmitted onto the ward having dropped out of care can access support and, and be supported to deal with their diagnosis, the health issues, and to try and you know recover and live well with HIV. And then lastly, to work with the health advisor team to uh, try to re-engage those patients who have been lost to follow-up, uh, because obviously that's going to be a huge risk to their health um, uh, to, in terms of them not being able to take treatment, then onward transmission becomes an issue, and then obviously readmission onto the ward. So that's how we're working with Chelsea and Westminster. On the larger kind of overview of that, this is what we've been achieving uh, in this last few years across the, the 12 programmes. Uh, and that's, been, that's included increasing HIV testing, uh, increasing HIV peer support, and increasing direct support and care planning in relation to thinking about how people are supported to live well with HIV. Uh, and clearly, things like um, poverty and so that the, the Positive UK also hosts a, a benefits program and we've uh, we've we've managed to uh, support people to to claim uh, nearly three quarters of a million pounds of unclaimed benefits that uh, that uh, since we've been working on the project, 
uh, and really thinking about how we make sure that the, those who are diagnosed are, are immediately engaged in care and have that opportunity to engage in peer support is a is a really clear way of thinking about making those connections and maintaining engagement in care. And then last but not least, the empowerment programme around addressing stigma. So uh, we say we, we launch next week with six voluntary sector organisations working in partnership um, uh, around delivering different training programmes to different demographics and, and communities. Um, and that, uh, that work stream will be to address internalised stigma so that people feel confident <clears throat> and able to engage in care and, uh, and optimise their health and wellbeing. Uh, the other part of the project will be to train a team of HIV ambassadors. Um, and they'll be linked then into Fast Track Cities London in relation to be able to speak publicly, as well as then to be able to link in with some of that place based work um, uh, and wider societal work to address stigma, since obviously the, the lived experience part of the, the, the process is one of the things that really addresses stigma. Um, it's that it's uh, hearing and, and seeing people living with HIV and, and hearing those experiences that are going to hopefully change public perceptions and so all of this work is contracted to be done over the next year uh, and we have a really robust evaluation program in place to be able to look at what, where the successes are and how we can then bring those uh, different projects together at the end of it and see if there's a, a standardised way of moving forwards and continuing with that work. And so that's the overview both of the strategy and some of the granular detail and I will unshare my screen and say thank you very much for your attention. Hey, thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Gary. And we're now um, going to move to Stephen Nicholson, who's going to um, tell us about the, tra the, the trend setting uh, first out of the traps, uh, Brighton and Hove uh, Fast Track City Initiative. Thank you very much. I'll just turn my camera off while I share my screen. Good afternoon. Thank you uh, for inviting me to share some of the work that we've been doing on Fast Track Cities. Um, people may not know Brighton and Hove. It's a, a small seaside city on the southeast coast of England, about an hour outside London. Uh, the population is um, around 250,000. It's a lively, vibrant city. It has a relatively young population with a large lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender community. Uh, in 2017, sorry to contradict you, Bertrand, but Brighton Hove did become the first UK fast track city uh, with the mayor and the leader of the council signing the Paris Declaration to end HIV as a public health threat in cities by, 2020, by 2030. The local delivery vehicle for Brighton and Hove as a fast track city is the Towards Zero HIV Task Force. Uh, the task force is a partnership between the city council a fantastic local charity, the Martin Fisher Foundation, voluntary and community sector organisations, academics, clinicians, and of course, members of the community. Uh, the task force is, is jointly chaired by the council and the Martin Fisher Foundation. Um, uh, one of the, the many strengths of this approach, apart from the, the skills and expertise the charity brings, is their ability to fundraise and to develop and support new and innovative projects, which I hope you'll see as I go through this presentation. Partnership is absolutely key to the success of our first track city work um, and brings together a rather disparate group of people for common purpose. For example, the, the Gay Men's Rugby Club, a range of faith groups, East Sussex Fire and Rescue Service and Brighton Hove Bus Company have all been involved in, in various initiatives. Um, and here is UNAIDS Executive Director Winnie Bainema visiting us last summer at the Brighton Hove AIDS Memorial with the, the leader of the council, some of our members and all three of our local MPs, Lloyd Russell Moyle, Peter Kyle and Caroline Lucas. Political buy-in is, is great. Uh, as you can see, we're making good progress. And we've achieved or exceeded the 95, 95, 95 targets. Brighton and Hove has the eighth highest prevalence of diagnosed HIV in England and the, the highest outside of London. Just over 2,400 patients attend for HIV treatment and care in the city. The vast majority are men who have sex with men. 
the vast majority are, or the majority are white, although around half of women living with HIV in Brighton and Hove are black African. We have a relatively low rate of late diagnosis of HIV at 28% compared to 42% in England overall. And the challenge remains now to end new transmissions, to identify undiagnosed infection, get people onto treatment, and to eliminate HIV stigma and discrimination. And I just want to share with you some examples of the work that has been done in these three areas. So we know that correct use of condoms prevents HIV from being passed on. We know that once diagnosed and on effective treatment, people with an undetectable virus can't transmit HIV. This has become the basis of the U equals U prevention campaign, undetectable equals untransmittable. Uh, we also know that taking some of the drugs used to treat HIV before being exposed to the virus stops people acquiring HIV through sexual exposure. Pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP is now routinely commissioned in sexual health services. In Brighton Hove, over 900 people are accessing PrEP through the sexual health service. Brighton and Hove prides itself on being a digital city. And uh, in April last year, a locally co-designed app was launched to help people manage their PrEP. As you can see on the slide, the, the platform provides a range of functions, including secure access to STI results and blood tests, appointments, medical information and reminders, as well as communication with clinical services. Over 200 people are using the app already. We're also trying to focus on individuals who would benefit from PrEP but don't access mainstream or clinical services. This might include members of minority ethnic groups, women and hidden groups of men who have sex with men. So to try and increase access to PrEP, we're developing a weekly PrEP clinic in a community setting. Excuse me, sorry. So we have good access to HIV testing in the city. This is a slide that we often use on websites and resources showing the wide range of places people can get an HIV test in the city. Uh, this includes the touchscreen digital vending machines that were developed by the Martin Fisher Foundation, funded by the Public Health England Innovation Fund, and which won the 2018 British Medical Journal Innovations Award. Uh, the vending machines dispense the, the latest highly accurate self-test kits and collect anonymous user information such as age, sex, place of residence, testing history, which can all, all inform future development of HIV services. The first machine has been distributing self-test kits at the Brighton Sauna since 2017. And we now have seven machines in venues across the city, including in the Main City Library and the Black and Minority Ethnic Community, Par Community Partnership Centre. Uh, two more machines are planned for university sites. And here's one in Lusaka in Zambia, also a fast track city. Now, all of these options for HIV testing are really great, but they do all rely on people presenting to test. So it's great news that the government announced on World AIDS Day 2021 plans to offer opt out HIV testing at accident and emergency departments in the 20 areas in England with the highest prevalence of diagnosed HIV. Testing at A&E in Brighton and Hove will begin in April and we're currently working with NHS partners and others on the delivery plans for this project. Data show that opt-out testing can be effective in reaching those groups who do not routinely access HIV testing in other settings. So an evaluation of another project in the city, a pilot offering opt-out HIV testing to people having a blood test in primary care general practice is also currently underway. Uh, the third of our key work areas is to challenge and end HIV stigma and discrimination. There is a new international stigma target which is that less than 10% of people living with HIV experience stigma and discrimination by 2025. A number of campaigns addressing stigma have been developed in the city, including this one starring Stiggy, the stigma saw. He was created to gently show how outdated information should be extinct like dinosaurs. But by learning the, the new facts, the stigma saw could be, become a more empathetic member of society. Um, Stiggy made multiple appearances on local radio and television uh, at, at Pride and other local events and even made a trip to the House of Commons. Campaigns have also been delivered that feature uh, patient experience, people talking about patient experiences, uh, addressing stigma within the family and addressing stigma in the workplace. Waiting for the, the full results of the latest people living with HIV stigma index survey, but preliminary results are, are encouraging. 
In 2015, 36% of respondents to the people living with HIV stigma index from the southeast reported experiencing gossip. In 2019, this reduced to 19%. An HIV stigma-free hospital project was launched at the Royal Sussex County Hospital in Brighton on World AIDS Day. The aim is to continue this work for stigma-free city healthcare, including dentists, and then finally, a stigma-free city. Efforts also continue to promote public awareness and engagement. We try to hold regular community stakeholder events to set the future agenda for public awareness and education strategies. This public information bus developed by the Martin Fisher Foundation, again, in partnership with Brighton Health Buses, ensures that positive messages are seen all day, every day throughout Brighton and Hove. Inside the bus, the panels describe recent advances in HIV treatment and they promote testing and address stigma. Thank you for listening. And I'll leave you with a final message from the bus. Get tested, get treated, live well. Thanks very much. I hope I've stopped sharing. That was that was a uh, excellent, a uh, Stephen. Thank you very much. Excuse me, I'm trying to stop sharing. That. I don't know if that's managed just yet. Well, you've reinforced the message because we've uh, <laughs> we've seen that. Bring on for attention. A button should come up at the top, Stephen. And it so hasn't. If you if you move the mouse to the top of your screen. Oh. Oh, but I'm sorry, folks. Well, Lisa had said to us. Er, well, Lisa had to us earlier that she was just going to speak. <laughs> I am. Uh, and uh, hadn't hadn't any a uh, presentation. So I was going to say just to start. Uh, but in fact, uh, Stephen has removed his the back end of his bus. So, uh, um, Lisa, who is from Farrakh, Cardiff and The Ville, uh, you can now listen to your uh, uh, audio overview. Thank you, everybody. Well, after the Lord Mayor's Feast, we've heard from what I think um, are the two most sophisticated and generally long long standing fast tracks in the UK um, to Cardiff, fast track Cardiff and Vale. We're the only fast track city in Wales um, and we are starting from a very much lower position than, than you two have. Um, we're currently the only fast track city in Wales but North Wales is in the offing. I know that I've, I've seen Heleth, Heleth Roberts is with us. Um, Heleth, I'll talk to you more about this off screen, but we are hoping for a second one very soon. We have less than half a million people. Um, we're a very young city. There's a lot of uh, students. Um, there's a large LGBT population, uh, a more sizable uh, population of black and brown people than in the rest of Wales. Um, so, you know, Cardiff and Vale is, is an interesting place to be for this. Um, we have a different system in Wales. We have a different NHS. There's no separation of commissioning and all prevention work lies with either the local health boards or Public Health Wales, which is part of the Welsh Government. Um, and for HIV in practical terms, that means we've had no prevention work and no testing messages commissioned for over a decade. Um, which unsurprisingly means that we've got the worst late diagnosis rates in in Britain um, across Wales. And certainly um, we're seeing it within Cardiff and Vale. Um, the local health boards think that Public Health Wales ought to pay for it all. Public Health Wales um, is providing a very good national postal testing service, but thinks unsurprisingly that the health boards should be paying for it. As a result of all of this, we have no community or NGO sector. We have no HIV Welsh HIV charity operating in Wales. We have no peer support whatsoever and a very little bit of social care support in some of the clinics. So Fast Track here is starting from, um, I like to think of it as a bit like the Wild West of HIV work again. Uh, I mean, there's some great stuff that we've done here, but it's very piecemeal. 
Um, so fast tracks in Wales, actually, it's easier to create them along health board lines because that's where the power is. So that's what we seem to be doing. And I'd like to say we're incredibly grateful to fast track cities and Bertrand for providing an incredibly useful hook for lots of us who wanted to get something done to have a vehicle for getting that done and for pointing to other cities that were doing things well. So Fast Track Cardiff and Vale is hosted and chaired by Pride Cymru, which is an independent LGBT um, rights org. And it includes two local authorities, Cardiff and the Vale, uh, the Health Board and very strong representation from Cardiff University. If you go and look at our website, you'll see we have loads of research work and research publications on there. Um, and we also have representation from uh, the com key communities and volunteer support from people like uh, myself and Mark Lewis. We're very pleased to say that a third of our steering group, which is our active management group, are themselves people openly living with HIV. Um, currently, everyone is a volunteer, although that's about to change. And we have three priorities. Um, we are looking to have better data. And it's one of the reasons why I'm not showing you uh, much data today is that our data is deeply wobbly in Wales. Um, we are looking for increased access to testing and testing of many kinds. And like the other cities, uh, it's important to tackle stigma for us. So those are our three aims. And we've been working on these independently for the last 18 months. And we've managed to get ourselves heavily involved in the ongoing creation of an HIV action plan for Wales. We haven't got one yet. It should be coming out sometime early this summer. Um, and that's got specific work being done in subgroups on stigma and on peer support, um, as well as on, on data and clinical work. Um, we have um, just our existence has actually encouraged change to happen. It's very weird. It's almost like they're saying fast track will come and get you if you um, don't have a think about it. I, I, I mean, I exaggerate slightly, but really not very much. It, miraculously, in the first lockdown, Public Health Wales brilliantly pivoted to start providing a national free postal HIV testing system all year round. And that has made a huge difference. Um, but unfortunately, they, they didn't actually tell anybody except for the clinics about it. So a big part of our work has actually been trumpeting um, that free testing across, uh, across Wales and getting that information out and creating a Wales HIV testing week to do it in November um, with, with the rest of Europe. Um, we have um, supported um, the people in the Welsh Government to try and find increased resources for accurate, timely data. Um, and we're arguing in the action plan for a case management system that will work across the whole country. Currently, each health board commissions its own IT and data work and none of them talk to each other. Um, you can imagine the kind of chaos that, that creates when people move around from one health board to another. Um, in terms of testing, we have that amazing free postal testing. Um, and we are now using that and working with Terence Higgins Trust as well on a pilot programme. We've we've done a pilot with a bunch of GPs in the south of Cardiff, which is now Gilead is funding us um, to extend it to the whole of Cardiff and Vale. Very simple. GPs text all their adult patients, offering them a free HIV test and recommending it. And it's up to the patients whether they would like that or not. But we have found that to be highly successful in identifying people from um, higher risk groups who have not previously tested, who have actually then asked for the test through us. So that is now being rolled out across Cardiff and Vale. We've also had interest in it from North Wales. And indeed, we understand that uh, there are some places in England that may be, may be looking at that and interested in it too now. Um, the work we've done on stigma and that, that sorry, te texting for testing is now a one year project with a worker attached to it, which we're recruiting for currently. Um, in terms of stigma work, we have done a lot of work to just support people with HIV to start speaking out. We have produced a mural in Butte Town, a particularly um, good uh, a working class area of Cardiff um, that has been particularly neglected in the past, um, that's had a lot of publicity. Um, and we are pushing very hard in the HIV 
uh, action plan for peer support work. We're working with Tackle HIV as their Welsh partner um, with, and alongside um, working with THT as well. And um, we are, although it's not one of our targets, supporting a lot of work around prep awareness and delivery. Um, again, during the lockdown, we managed to pivot to virtual clinics uh, and we've eliminated a waiting list, which was a rather substantial one before that, and now have a very fast service. And again, we're hoping that that will act as a model for the rest of Wales. So in 2022, we're going to uh, we have, as I said, we've got funding for Gilead from the for the texting for testing project with GPs. Um, but we also have two year funding from Vive to create a Welsh HIV advocacy network um, because we've come across in the last 18 months. A lot of people in Wales very keen to get more done around HIV and to become activists and also to start working towards creating proper peer support in Wales. So we're also recruiting at the moment. If you know anyone, it's open till February the 14th. We're looking for somebody to run an HIV advocacy network across Wales um, as part of the future work. And um, we're also trying to make sure that the action plan listens to the voices of people with HIV and people within um, within those groups that are most at risk by by talking it up, getting people to respond to it, ensuring that there are people on the subgroups who are themselves living with HIV. And we're bracing for the local authority elections in May and hoping that we retain uh, the people who've been champions for us because we have had tremendous support um, from the local authority and indeed the health board. Um, and I would just say to you, if you're in Wales, please come and talk to us, support our aims with the action plan. If you have Welsh friends, let them know about us. And we're very keen to work, um, as Heleth will know, in a cross-party way across Wales. We welcome more involvement. We need to create a revolution around HIV and sexual health in Wales, and we're on our way. And thanks to Fast Track. Thank you very much. A, uh, so that was a, uh, I, I, I thought I, a very positive a contribution. We've got about 10 minutes or so or um, any questions or points that anybody uh, wants uh, to raise. So either with the electronic hand or simply waving a uh, hand, I, uh, I'll come to anybody who, who wants to make any point. Uh, Mark. I see you have your electronic hand raised, so. Yeah, I, I won't turn my camera off because I've got a very uh, bad uh, broad, uh, bandwidth at the moment. Just a question to Bertrand uh, regarding um, other cities in the country that are not in the pipeline yet to become fast track cities. Um, what support can parliamentarians give um, other cities or other regions um, within uh, the UK? To become a fast track city and also what support can parliamentarians give um, current fast track cities um, to develop um, policies in line with the HIV action plan in England, the one being developed in Scotland and Wales and especially in Belfast where access to sexual health and HIV services is pretty bad. What uh, support can uh, parliamentarians um, not only in Westminster, but in the devolved nations, give to those um, initiatives. Okay, so that's five questions, and I have five minutes, I guess. So, uh, just on um, the, the the recruitment of the cities or or you know health boards or, or whatever that, that that are missing um, are on the the map of the fast track United Kingdoms at the moment. Um, I, I think everyone understands that a good part of making the initiative work at the local level is building the right network and the right partnerships and making sure that the different categories of stakeholders are involved. And I'm sorry that I forgot Brighton. I should have mentioned Brighton first because Brighton is an excellent example of a city where that happened with absolutely zero support from IAPAC. You know, everyone was on board uh, the, the day the city signed. Um, 
including uh, the, the local elected leaders and parliamentarians, and that's what made it work, really. Um, so um, a good kind of help that I think everyone could get from parliamentarians is um, helping in making these connections locally and making the, the connections between the uh, local partners and us. Because obviously, you know, I'm here sitting in, in my flat in Paris. I don't know everyone in every single UK cities. So, <laughs> you know, um, that, that's something that would be really useful. Um, the other part that is really useful for candidate and member cities is really for parliamentarians to keep in touch with the local stakeholders and the local uh, steering groups and steering committees of fast track cities and make sure that you know from time to time there are like catch up meetings where everyone knows what everyone is doing and what everyone is planning on doing because that's the best way to raise awareness of the priority that we still have and as jane and gary said even in cities where uh, we have reached the 395 there are still priorities uh, and you know i won't make any comparison with any other pandemic but you know, until we get to zero, we are not at zero, obviously. So, um, um, really trying to find ways for parliamentarians to be either part of the local partnerships and networks or as close at the local networks as possible is the best way to help, I think. Um, and that's exactly also what we need um, in Scotland, what we need in Belfast. And, well, I think Lisa is in a good position to do that in Wales. I don't think you need us, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you, Bertrand. I'm going to uh, come to Baris Masham. Just unmuting. I've unmuted. I just wanted to ask about Brighton. Uh, does Brighton still have, was it called the Phoenix House, the rehab centre up the hill? Uh, it was that, it was really good. I visited it when we did the report with Norman Fowler. The, the beacon, Sister the beacon. beacon. You said, the beacon. Certainly, yep. Yeah. Certainly, the the, the thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. Certainly, the beacon is um, is is still uh, very active. They've got their annual half marathon in, in the ne in the next few next few weeks, but they're still providing inpatient uh, uh, service for for HIV and. Uh, a day service as well. There is a women and families service um, and structured daycare provided out of the beacon. They do a great job. I think having a halfway house is so important for some people who come out of hospital and they're not quite ready to go for home and it just builds them up and gives them confidence. Absolutely. I don't think many, many beacons are around uh, the, the country. There should be more. And uh, Liz Barker. Um, thank you very much, and thank you, Bertrand, for that Parisian siren going down the street. That um, for those of us who haven't been able to come for a long time, that lifted our hearts. Um, uh, uh, it's very clear from all the presentations that the one thing that Fast Track Cities does is it uh, either galvanises people um, who are already working in the field but a bit disparate or it gives people like Jane, who've been here since God was a girl, uh, a new way to draw people together to create uh, sort of added value. My, my, I have two uh, questions I'd like to ask. One is when and how do you think you will be able to draw from all of this, the lessons about what cities uniquely can get out, out of this uh, and how they can and how they can do that um and the second and, and the second question is what do you think can be extrapolated from the uh, experience of different cities which will, will feed into other settings and and i'm thinking specifically of um, the information that we got from, forget, forget uh, Vivo Gilead, can't remember last week, about 
the in in the United Kingdom, there being towns in which there is a very high prevalence, an unusually high prevalence. So how do we take whatever works in cities and begin to take what is relevant to that out to other population groups? Is that um, a question to me or? Yeah, no, I'm happy to anybody chip in. <laughs> I'm going to chip in very quickly about London. Um, we've actually got um, an academic from Oxford University, Sara Caparini, working with us on some of this. And we're trying to write up as we go the things that are working, why they're working, and trying to capture that. And for me, it's actually crucial that we get that evidence base out there. But I would say, Baroness Barker, I think one of the things about cities is they are unique. And so there's this thing about there's a national, you know, th there are things that happen at national level, but there are things that can happen at city level, which may not be the same for every city. And, you know, when I think about London trying to join, we were more like, I think, Bertrand, you would say we were more like Berlin in our structure or Madrid in our structure than we were like Birmingham. Um, and so, you know, having those federated or broken up cities, were, it was a really interesting conversation about which cities structurally is most like London. And it wasn't a, a UK city. So that's um, the first thing. And I think the second thing is I wonder, and I don't have any evidence for this yet, but I wonder if the ICSs, these integrated care systems that are now coming into place, which are meant to be whole system approaches, whether there is a way for cities to somehow uh, become embraced within those structures and to say, and I, I think it's, you know, for example, London's got five ICSs, but nonetheless, in smaller cities or rural areas, is there a way to integrate what's happening in the ICSs in those partnership arrangements? And I think that will take an innovative uh, approach to give it a go and see what happens. If I could jump in slightly, I, I want to agree with Jane. I, um, actually, getting the evidence base is incredibly important. Um, and all the projects that we do always ha have a very strong research element um, an evaluation element built in. And that's the beauty of having such a strong link with Cardiff University and their clinical trials unit. They've been incredibly generous in providing really high quality support. And both of our projects this year are going to have um, how to evaluation type reporting attached to them so that lessons can be learnt um, and, and so that things can be replicated. But I also think that um, it is very it is very different in different areas. And for me, it's been incredibly important that um, Fast Track Cities is actually very flexible and allows us to be Fast Track Health Boards in Wales effectively. Um, and we're going to have some interesting challenges because some of our areas do not have any cities in them, but they desperately need to collaborate between different silos and create reforms. And actually, for me, it's called Fast Track Cities, but it's about breaking down silos and collaborating in specific delineated areas. And that's what's done it for us. If I can just add one bit on that, uh, it, it definitely compares to what's happening in, in other countries as well. Uh, and I have two examples. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm from Paris. Paris was one of the first fast track cities. Um, one addition that was made two years ago was adding the neighboring province department of Saint-Saint-Denis to fast track cities. Obviously, it's not a city, it's a province. Uh, and they chose to join fast track cities just because most of the population living in Saint-Saint-Denis travels to Paris by bus or subway or whatever to get access to everything, testing, care, treatment, everything. So if you look at the epidemiology in Paris, a good part of it is actually people not living in Paris. So, you know, from a, an organic point of view, it made sense to have this kind of partnership. Another example is, is Brescia in, in Italy. It's a middle-sized city. It's like 200,000 people. But they have the biggest community of migrants from uh, um, the Middle East in the whole of Italy. They have like refugee camps, literally, with tens of thousands of people there. And they're not in the city. They're on the outskirts of the city. So if you look at the administrative uh, structure, they're not part of the city. But when Brescia joined Fast Track City, their first priority was actually to work 
with the administrations in these different refugee camps to give them access to information, prevention, care and treatment. So as, as Lisa and Jen said, what we are trying to do is adapt to basically the needs. So it's called fast track cities, it's not always cities. Excellent. Uh, and I do think the point you made, Lisa, is a really, really important one about geographies rather than just being a, um, you know, confined to the metropolitan cities. Uh, uh, important. Um, I've got questions uh, from Alan Thewis and Lloyd Russell Moyle. And although we're slightly over time, let's um, uh, take those contributions. Uh, uh, so, Alison, you'd like to go next. Thanks very much and thank you to everybody for their presentations. It's been really interesting hearing all the different work that's been going on. And I wondered if I could ask Bertrand if there's, I, I'm curious as to how people who um, contract HIV through injecting drugs um, are treated as part of this, uh, the systems you have in place in Paris, because um, that's a big barrier, I suppose, to, to reaching some people in my city of Glasgow. They're less likely to be part of, of a system of treatment. And I just wondered how that was approached in France. Uh, nightmare? Uh, uh, nightmare from a, a political and social perspective. Um, the thing is, um, the way we deal and, and involve or not involve people who use drugs in France is still very much a political um, issue or seen as a political issue, um, there is what we call a safe injection room and that opened in Paris, I think 18 months or two, year, two years ago now. There were supposed to be five more opening in the first half of 2022. And uh, to be totally blunt with you, they've, they've all been put on hold because the mayor of Paris is running for the presidential election in April, and she didn't want to be confronted with any political opposition on that topic, uh, right? And, and it would have made a big turmoil for her. I do understand that. But, you know, for people working on, on in, in public health and for the community of people who use drugs, the, the result of that is that there's still only one safe injection room in, in, in Paris instead of the six that were planned to, to be in place now, basically. Um, there are others in other cities in, in, in France, in Montpellier uh, and in Lyon, very small ones. Um, honestly, the best ones I know in Europe are in Luxembourg and Geneva. Um, and Again, to be totally blunt, <laughs> my next visit to the UK is to Glasgow. <laughs> to, please, please come and say hello. Um, I will, definitely, because, you know, there, 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 there was a very good, very active, large group that met on, on Fast Track Cities in Glasgow two years ago, Then everything was stopped when COVID started, and we need to really reinvigorate that group and, and make sure that Glasgow followed the path of, of other UK fast track cities. So that's that's my next visit. You know, I'm not a magician, but... <laughs> Merci. <laughs> Merci. No, I'm sure Alison and certainly myself and others would you know, do anything we can to assist you in that uh, regard, Bertrand. And then finally from Lloyd, uh, Russell Moyle, who I, I think featured quite prevalently in one of the yeah. presentations, I was going to say that we hadn't heard about Brighton because had such a self-effacing yeah. member of parliament and we'd never heard anything that, yeah. never hear anything goes on in Brighton. <laughs> yes, thank you, David. Um, uh, we had a really good ministerial visit actually to Brighton. Uh, um, we've got a temporary minister uh, on, on these areas, Maria Caulfield, uh, in of course, covering England, uh, but, uh, but the government minister. Um, she's the minister for three months covering public health. She might be there for longer, we will, we will see. But she might not be there at all if the reshuffle goes off a certain way. But um, what was what I wanted to say is some of the some of the discussions that are interesting out of that, which is, uh, and, and I think it carries on from Baroness Barker's question, is how do you take this out of the cities? And how do you, and, and in 
in, in places like Brighton, it was possible because there was such an active civil society that pushed the political leaders. The political leaders were very receptive to the idea anyway. They jumped on board quite quickly and the NHS providers already were uh, together. It hadn't been commissioned, for example, separately and privately. So the commissioning was already still part of the NHS and the council together. So all of that was fertile ground. Whereas in lots of other areas in the country, it's not fertile ground in the same way. And so where, you know, a bit like Lisa, you were saying where there's no kind of, um, where there is no NGOs doing that pushing. Is it that we need the minister to kind of be saying to every area, you need to be setting up a zero HIV committee? And I think we're probably not using the word fast track 1990 anymore. We're talking about zero COVID, aren't we here? And, and it, does it work top down? Um, it's kind of the question, or does it have to be a voluntary effort bottom up? Um, or can we kind of get a bit of kind of push from the top? And then the other kind of thing was 1990 seems to have gone out the window. But the thing that also was said at the meeting with the minister is you equals you actually is not a very good slogan. It doesn't connect with people. It doesn't work. I actually kind of probably agree with that and actually can't pass it on is a probably much better slogan. And I know it's a bit proprietary because it's from some organisations, but actually getting the messaging right as well that isn't wonky to get people on board. So it's, first of all, getting the messaging right. How do we kind of get that and in, adapt it? Is it possible? And secondly, how does it have to be bottom up or can we get some top down pressure to make sure every area has a zero, co uh, sorry, zero HIV committee? Okay. Lisa, I think you wanted to say something there. And you're on mute. Yeah. It's compulsory on one of these calls for somebody so to be on mute. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to, to say, Russell, that um, in Wales we, we have IMTPs and every health board is required to have an IMTP around sexual health. doesn't actually mean they do any work other than contraceptives. Um, so I think you need pressure from the bottom and the top. Um, and interestingly, we have the pressure from the top. Uh, we don't have it from the bottom. And that's why we're, re we're creating um, a network of people who will start to bring people together at a grassroots level uh, in different areas of Wales. Our single biggest health board has has no, no sexual health, no HIV clinic and no, no HIV services at all. People literally have to go into England for it. Um, so squeeze from both ends please please help us out and, and yes, it's I, possible to take it out into other areas you just need to um you need to get people realizing that they are going to be asked awkward questions if they don't do something and for me that that's one of the most important things that politicians can do for us is ask questions thank you because that's gary's just has put on the chat exactly the same having some movement of top down and bottom up from community NGO engagement have been essential. So yeah. I, we, uh, we didn't work together for years for nothing. Uh, good. Uh, I've okay, got one. I'm going to come finally to your good self. Then. I think because you think you want to say something. So is that me? Yes. Ah. Yes. Okay. Great. No, I think I agree completely with these pincer movements, top up, bottom, whatever it is. But I think one of the things is having a common purpose and actually people feeling good about the common purpose and setting up something that actually you can deliver on and feel good about because actually it's great and where we've got everybody now in london saying i want this to happen yes are we so it's it's somehow helping people go in a direction that actually feels good for everybody as well um, and that's that's a sort of a softer thing it's not necessarily a pincer movement it's about it's a it's a softer piece of influencing excellent well thank you everybody for the contribution bertrand i just looking at chat i see that alice lewis has left her email for you for your visit um glasgow if you want to to take into that i found previously some chance after the end of the at the end of the call. Um, yeah. Thanks as well to uh, Mark um, for pulling a, what has, I think has been really a fascinating um, conversation uh, and presentations together. Uh, and, and I think something from which, you know, as parliamentarians, we take um, some uh, um, action points uh, for, for. So thank you everyone for your uh, participation.
Thank you very much for the invitation. That was yeah. great. 